So, um, Mohan kind of like gave me a fairly broad uh, uh, canvas and said that, you know, talk about something which is interesting to this, uh, this group, which might be mildly motivating. So I was thinking about this, how should I kick it off? And I, was, I happened to have the privilege of being in a, um, uh, in a leadership kind of thing with uh, Bill Clinton once. So he had come and talked. And he said that, uh, you know, never have more than three points in, uh, in a speech because nobody's going to remember more than three points. So I actually don't remember what three points he said in his speech, but I remember this point, uh, <laughs> which is that don't say more than three points. So the point is that the half-life of uh, any conversation or any lecture is actually very small. The stuff evaporates very, very quickly. And I think the ability to take and understand the key points and kind of keep it with you is uh, going to be a very important aspect as you go through, uh, go through this course. So uh, I'll start off with a quote by, the, uh, by this uh, American uh, uh, author called Henry Adams, which says, a teacher affects eternity because you can never tell when his influence stops. Right? You can never tell when the influence stops. So think about that, and we'll come back to it towards the end. So I uh, offer the following uh, sort of observations for your consideration, right? And I'll make three observations. The first, my first observation is about time. And it is that not all moments are created equal. What do I mean by that? It is that, as you will see your career trajectory, it looks a little bit like stock prices, right? It'll be long periods where there, it'll be flat to slightly going up, and then step functions where it kind of like goes up or down. It really is, it's like how the earnings profile of companies is, it's how the, you know, nothing actually goes nice in a smooth straight line in a, as in a spreadsheet. So what are those points, right, where the step function changes occur? And how do you recognize them and what do you do about them? So uh, it is really important to have, at least first recognize that not all moments are created equal. And the way I would think about it is that uh, there's this um, cartoon image which comes to my mind, I think it was in the New Yorker, where there are two dinosaurs talking, right? And this one nerdy dinosaur uh, is talking to this older dinosaur. And he's saying, look, it just, listen to me, now seems to be the time to develop the technology to deflect an asteroid. <laughs> because you know the asteroids came and just wiped out the dinosaurs, right? So there are some times where you really have to buckle down and think hard. And what are those points? And what I would call them, those are the transition points in your careers. Those are at least one, of, one set of points which are really important are the transition points in your careers. And what are those transition points? Transition points are, the first one would be, I would say, when you enter college, so like which college you go to, which sort of like happens in uh, very early in our career before you even realize what's happening. So let's ignore that. The first significant one is the first job you take. It actually has a bearing of what you, what's going to happen through the, uh, through the rest of your careers. The second one might be the second job you take, because after three or four years, you might actually take another job. Uh, another one is uh, getting married. That's a transition point, right? Who you get married to has got a huge, Warren Buffett says that's the most important decision you'll make in your life. I agree. The next one there would be having kids. A little bit more for women usually than men. It's a big transition point, right? The decisions you make at those points are really important because they have an impact which is trailing impact way longer than what you think. So if you think about it, now you get the idea of what I mean by transition points, is that these occur every four or five years. So in your entire working life, it might occur eight or nine times, 10 times. So they don't occur too often, right? So it's very important to think of those transition, uh, transition points. And what are the decisions you make at that point? So the first thing I would say is that once you recognize it, that itself is a big thing. Because you'll pause and take your time figuring things out. So, um, <clears throat> now, because when I see, especially when changing jobs or taking a job, uh, most folks have this high degree of impatience about actually landing one and starting a job. But if you think about it, there's a guy who wrote The Black Swan, which uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, uh, another person I just bumped into once in a conference, uh, is, uh, he had a great uh, line which says that the three most harmful addictions of human beings are heroin, carbohydrates, and a regular paycheck. Sorry? So this addiction to a regular paycheck is very high. And that what happens is that it makes you do things 
you hurry up and want to like join, okay, I've left this job, I need to make a change, I join. And Mohan mentioned about, trans about <coughs> career transitions, which all of you are potentially thinking about. And the point I want to make is you have to be both patient and diligent when you think about it. Because the decision you make actually lasts four or five years and sometimes longer. And good decisions can have a huge impact in, in how your career shapes up. Why? Because luck plays a huge role in that. So let's uh, talk about the, uh, the second one. Uh, so the second observation I have is about uh, people and places. Okay. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Uh, which is that where you live and the people you hang out with has got a huge bearing on how your future is going to look. Uh, so in terms of people, it's somewhat more obvious, but let's just talk about it. The way I think about it is that your average IQ is the IQ of the five people in your speed dial list in your mobile phone. Okay, most likely. What that means is that you're interacting these folk with these folks for the maximum amount of time, right? And if you are dealing with folks who are smarter than you, broadly, then you are actually going to get smarter too. And they are going to pull you up. But if you're dealing with folks who are actually dragging you down in any way, shape, or form, I'm not talking about academic smarts only, by the way. I'm not just talking about IQ. It's about EQ, about people who actually think through uh, decisions in their lives, who are actually, who have ethics, right? Who actually have certain values, who implement those things. They're not angry people. They are not vindictive folks. These are important characteristics to think about as you hang out with those people. Because when that happens, it will actually become part of you too. And that is what is, you know, having luck help you, right? Because when you actually do that, then these folks, you just don't have to depend on opportunities you create yourself. You can actually have the benefit of opportunities these folks see because they will pull you in. Uh, in each of the uh, things which I started, Snapfish, EasyTap, and now Prime Ventures, I did not come up with the idea. I was just fortunate enough to be in the company of people who actually had the original idea. And they said, hey, look, you know, how about we do it together? And so my thing is that when you get an opportunity to work with good people, take it. Because it just doesn't come at the right time. So the first time when I was uh, starting Snapfish, it was in the dot-com boom days, total boom. It was in uh, late 99. And uh, it just felt crazy to leave these, all these options on the table which I had. And uh, it's like, man, you know, I wish it was like a year later then I could actually have all these vests and I'll have more money in the bank. But the fact is not everything happens at that time because at that particular time, uh, there are three other co-founders. Two of them were my classmates from business school in Harvard and one of them was my classmate from IIT. So the personal conditions were such that you could actually go ahead and start this company together. And you cannot tell everybody else, like, wait, I just need a little bit more money in the bank. Right? It just doesn't work that way. So when you get an opportunity, first hang out with, them. be careful about the people you hang out with. Let's put it that way. And if you are actually discriminating, you'll find yourself gravitating towards the right crowd. And second, when you actually have an opportunity to work with them to start something, take it. Actually, I was having a conversation with an old classmate of mine, and he was saying that he regrets not having actually started a company with another one of his classmates. And the reason is that he said, we trusted each other so much, and yet it's a lost opportunity not to have done something together. So that's about people. Place also happens to be a little less intuitive, but actually a very important piece, and that's the geographic location. Right? So uh, if you want to do a tech business, be in Bangalore. Right? It just makes sense to do it. And the reason is, you're going to bump into other people who are also thinking similarly. And in the US, the analogy is, if you can afford it, be in the valley. right? Because that's where the action is, and the most likely things are going to happen there. So when you want to do something, you have to take steps, baby steps towards that. But in such a way, that the natural transitions out of those steps lead you to that goal. 
and it doesn't require some unnatural act of magic for you to do it, right? If you want to be in the Olympics, you probably want and be an athlete, you probably want to be in Kerala in the sports authority, you know, the, their institute there and running every day, right? It just makes sense because everybody around you is, do, is doing the same thing. I was actually having a chat with somebody, this was like a uh, uh, year and a half back, I think, uh, uh, and he was saying he's going to Stanford, Stanford undergrad. Uh, and he said, look, I want to be an entrepreneur. I said, awesome. But I just want to go to a bank, make some money, and then be an entrepreneur. So it could work. Chances are it won't, right? Because when you go to Wall Street and become a banker, you're going to make a lot of money, but it's very unlikely that you'll have a ghost of an idea of what it takes to start a company in the valley. Just wrong things. So transitions can occur, but they're not natural transitions. They're unnatural transitions. So let me give you an example of something which I did, which I think was actually quite boneheaded. So I uh, graduated from Stanford um, uh, with a computer science degree. And I was like, OK, great. You know, what should I do next? And one of my professors was actually leaving and starting a company. It just so happens he was starting it in Pittsburgh, which I don't know how much you're aware of the geography of the United States. It's in a broadly region called the Midwest. It's also very cold there. Um, now, things broadly turned out okay. I mean, the company was bought by IBM. I was a very early employee. So I got a lot of good experience and so forth. But if I think back about it, it just doesn't make any sense, if you want to be in technology, to get out of Silicon Valley. It just doesn't make any sense. Because you'll have a lot more opportunities bumping around. Right? This is like Brownian motion in, uh, in physics. You know, molecules are floating around and some of them hit and combine and something else forms. So you want to be in a position to get lucky because you need luck in your careers. But you cannot manufacture luck, but you can definitely increase the probability of getting lucky. Uh, so I learned my lesson from my early days and so when we were deciding to, uh, thinking about India, which is about, around eight years back, I figured, you know, I just want to be in India because interesting stuff is happening there. Uh, I was in the valley at that time, and I felt that it was going to be more interesting here in terms of the developments which are happening. And actually, as soon as we came, you know, we had the downturn, and things just tanked. Uh, but still, it felt to be the right place. And sure enough, interesting stuff happened. I happened to uh, you know, have a chance to meet with Nandan. In Nila Nandan Nilakani, I ended up working on the UID program for a year. I ended up meeting Sanjay who was my, uh, Sanjay Swami, who is my, now my partner, but my neighbor, where I lived. So we started talking about things, and we ended up starting EasyTap, and after that, uh, Prime Ventures, which is our venture firm right now. So it wouldn't have happened if you didn't choose the place, right? The physical place is an important thing. So think about that. So the third uh, observation uh, which I have is about um, about regrets, and this is about uh, thinking about you know regret for things which you have done tends to fade over time. But regret of things which you haven't actually is sort of inconsolable. It kind of remains. Uh, so you can do stuff, and it can be, you know, it can blow out and fall down and flame. But you'll probably be just fine with it. But if you really wanted to do something, and you said, you know what, now is such a great time. And I think it is a great time to be in India at this point of time. This is the only time when you're going to have 150 million, 200 million smartphones being sold every year. Once you have the smartphone penetration at 900 million or whatever it is, you're not going to have the same new growth in terms of smartphones. So these are all new things which are happening. And so at this point, if you did something, whatever you decide to do, of course it should be well thought out, then uh, you'll probably, even if it's, it doesn't work, it's okay. But it's sort of like uh, sad if you wanted to do something, you harbored that dream, and you really didn't get the courage to go ahead and do it. So uh, Bezos had actually had a, uh, has a very good story around this. So he was in Wall Street. He was doing very well in an investment bank, I think, at that time. This is back in 94. Uh, uh, and so he went and told his boss that, look, I need to, uh, I'm going to go. And so what are you going to do? I'm going to go to Seattle. So he's going from Wall Street to Seattle, right? Place thing again. Uh, and I'm going to start uh, this internet company to sell books. 
She says, look, it's an excellent idea, that's what his boss said, for somebody else to do who doesn't have such a great career trajectory as you do. So obviously that kind of put a young Jeff Bezos off his uh, track a little bit. So he said, you know what, go and uh, think about it for two days and then let's come back and discuss because I think you're making a mistake. Uh, so, which is by the way what uh, my boss told me when I was starting Snapfish as well. <laughs> um, and then, um, so two days later, Jeff Bezos comes back and he says that um, I'm still going to do it. So he says, why do you do that? And given Be how Bezos is, you know, a brilliant man by all measures, he said, I went back and decided what is the framework for making this decision? How do I actually make this decision? How do I think about it? And what he said is that I want to take decisions today so that if I actually when I look, I'm 80 and I'm looking back at my life, I'm actually minimizing the number of regrets. And he felt that at this time with internet, he felt was going to be a lot bigger than what people thought. 94 was just kind of sprouting. Even I recall being on a browser in like 92, 93 and thinking that, oh man, it looks really interesting, but I wonder what's going to happen. Someone like him wanted to do it. And so he took that decision. He left a lot of money at the table, drove across the entire country, and then started something in a place which he really didn't have any roots in, right? So that's minimizing regrets. So uh, it's important to think about that. Yeah, like look forward and then trace back a little bit to understand like how would you evaluate this decision. Sometimes it makes things a little, uh, a little bit easier. There is a, um, a line by uh, an um, American poet, right? It's a very, it's called, the name of the poet is uh, John Whittier. And the la two lines I remember are, of all sad things of tongue or pen, of all sad things of tongue or pen, the saddest are these it might have been, right? So be aware of that. So just to close it out, all right, I started by uh, saying that you know, teachers affect us for eternity. Uh, and I lend back a quote from Galileo, which says that uh, you can never teach a man anything. It also holds for women. You can never teach a man anything. You can only help him find it within himself. Right? So I wish you all the best in your quest for what you're looking for. In now likelihood, it's already within you. Thanks. <laughs>